All right, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to get back to it. This is, again, the second lecture um, for chapter one. All right, let's get back into this slideshow. All right, so we're going to talk about the kinds of research that sociologists do. Um, as a social science, we take more of a, an empirical um, approach to answering questions. So in other words, we like to use the scientific method. We like to use a lot of numbers. We like to get um, data to back up the claims that we make. Now, there is, again, the creation of theory, which is going to be using essentially a bunch of data to create a theory on a particular idea. But again, we're still basing those theories, basing those ideas, collections, basing our um, what we're saying about the world on empirical data. Um, and again, science is the idea that we need numbers, we need to prove what it is that we are trying to say, and we can't just make bold statements without really kind of backing them up. Um, and that means we have to go out and collect data. Um, and we do that in a variety of ways, which we're gonna get into here in a minute. But it's that, in a, that idea of going out, having a question and carrying out a sociological study is an empirical investigation. So, and that's just, we have a question, we're gonna go grab some data about it and then let's talk about it. Um, and then there's four type of sociological questions. So there's factual, which asks about issues concerning matters of fact rather than theory or morals. Um, comparative, which draws comparisons between two different kinds of societies or even two different groups within society. Um, and then developmental, which focuses on the origins or path of a development of a particular institution or a particular um, idea or any kind of thing. It's like, hey, how did we get to this place? And then there's theoretical, which really seeks to explain a particular range of observed events. So we have all this data. How can we explain that, right? And allows us to kind of generalize about the nature of social interactions and social life. Um, so we're not going to really do this activity, but you can kind of think about it. What are four different types of questions you could use, um, using each different type of theme that we're, um, that we are using in this chapter. And I'll give you kind of an idea. Okay. So we're going to go back to this page. Um, let's say we want to study, um, we want to study the impact uh, on income that maybe, or the impact on health that climate change has, okay? So a factual would be saying, these are new health issues that came out of ecological disasters, right? So that would be a factual thing. This thing caused this thing and we observed it. A comparative would be like, maybe, it caused more of an issue in this particular group because they lived closer to the disaster than this particular group. And here's why. Um, a developmental would be like, how did we get to a place where this environmental degradation was societally acceptable? And we talk through a number of people about um, how they view this or where they're getting their information or what have you. And then a theoretical is like, hey, so we're seeing this particular effect consistently um, in areas that have this kind of ecological disaster. So let's write a theory that essentially says when we have this kind of ecological disaster, it's going to really, we, we are predicting that now based on this happening in multiple different areas, that this is what's going to come out of this. Right. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of the difference is how you would frame that in all these different ways, if that makes sense. Um. So there are steps to a research process. You're going to have to figure out what your question is, and you're going to have to define it. You're going to have to be able to explain what it is you're trying to research and like at what level. You're going to review what's already been done. So you need to go figure out what research on that topic it, uh, has already been done. Then you're going to essentially figure out where you can create new information. So like, hey, um, like with me, I study accommodations practices and there's a lot of research out there on trauma survivors um, and the resources that they have, and maybe even the barriers to how they are or how they are or are not used. But what we, we don't always look at is the language we use in those accommodations and 
if that same language is used by trauma survivors to describe themselves, because if they don't have that, then those links are going to not be there, right? Um, and so what I am trying, what I would try to accomplish is essentially, okay, so we have this group, let's talk to this group and see if the language being used, they would self-identify as. And if not, then if they would consider themselves out of the accommodations that are actually geared towards them, if that makes sense. And then you're going to work out, I would work out how I want to communicate, um, how I want to, what, what, what is my research design? What do I want to do? And if I'm looking at self-identity, I'm going to need to talk to people that would identify as this or why somebody wouldn't if that classification um, logistically or on paper would, would identify this person, right? Um, now, if I was just doing like, hey, what are the barriers you experience? I could maybe do a survey and list a whole bunch of things that people could check off if these were barriers, depending on what it is I'm trying to get at in that particular moment. And then you carry out the research and then you're gonna figure out how to interpret your data. Um, do I have survey results where that data is right there based on the system that I'm using and it shows me how many people out of how many answers answered this question this way. And that gives me my essentially percentage. And then I need to report the findings. I need to write up, okay, well, I found that this many people out of this many said this or what have you, whether that's via interviews or, um, or through the survey. But we also need to figure out if the population that we got is representative of the population we want. If we're talking about all Americans, just doing a survey on a college campus isn't going to represent all Americans. It's gonna maybe represent colleges that are similar to that one. Um, so maybe if it's a division one school, a division one, and maybe if it's a BCTC, it will um, depict a, it will be a good representation of tech schools in the Kentucky area. Right. So it depends on where you're doing your research and who you who is participating, essentially who you can generalize the information to, because the populations may not be generalizable to on a very grand scale, if that makes sense. Um, so we do a lot of different kinds of research. Um, we do things that are quantitative, which um, is the second one on here, which is really dealing with numbers. Okay, we want numbers, we want fast numbers. So we're going to do surveys, we're going to do um, things that really explore statistical data, or really even explore data that's already out there, right? So we want to combine different, um, different questions and see if they have a relationship. So um, if we ask somebody to do something like list their gender, and then we ask them a question about um, uh, have they been harassed at work ever, right? Okay, we're going to, and then we compare those two answers and essentially say, okay, the number of people that said they are marked themselves as female consistently um, had higher um, instances of reporting uh, workplace harassment, then we can kind of make a correlation there in the data, right? Um, and that kind of, and sometimes we can find out that there's no correlation. We could put um, the people who work um, in the service industry and also in the entertainment industry um, and their harassment numbers and see if they're the same, right? And we may see that they're similar enough that, that there's not really a correlation between one job over the other one. Uh, and then you also have qualitative data and, and methods. And those really are collecting personal accounts, right? And they're doing interviews. They're observing um, a situation and watching for a long period of time. Um, they're looking at um, historical records and getting accounts from different perspectives. And it's really about um, relying on getting um, the narratives of people. And, and you want more of the nuance when you're looking at qualitative methods, right? You're looking at more of the, well, I might answer yes, but if I answer yes, this is why. Or I would say maybe, maybe because of this, right? You're getting at more of the themes that is that is the why behind it, as opposed to maybe just a yes, no, this, that kind of answer that may be in a survey. Um, ethnography is a firsthand study of people using the observation um, or field work. So Ethnographic research is going to be done by a researcher, and they're essentially going to immerse themselves into some kind of group, institution, what have you, and essentially they're going to be observing from within. So ethnography is really um, also, you can have autoethnographies where it's really talking about 
the researcher within a particular group or structure, but um, ethnography is really from the inside out, can we talk about a particular topic? And then you have participant observation, which is really widely used in sociology and anthropology where the research takes part in activities and groups and is really part, trying to become or immerse themselves as part of the um, part of what they're studying. And that's a little different than ethnography because um, while they're getting interviews and things with ethnography, they're really not engaging with um, necessarily always the topic, right? Um, and so some of that is observed at a distance. A survey is a method of sociological research where it's a bunch of questionnaires. And essentially what you're trying to get at is generalizing um, a particular population with less than having to get that entire population to answer the questions. So like the US Census is a good example of a survey. Um, surveys can be, they can have standardized or open-ended answers. And so when you have standardized, you're giving them fixed, uh, fixed options to choose from, whereas an open-ended, they get to answer the question more based on their own personal experiences. Um, it's really hard to make a survey that works for everyone. And it's really hard to make a survey that is able to capture everyone's um, notions because you have to put your own perspectives and kind of think outside yourself when you're making a survey because while you may see um, one, two, three as being the options for why something might be happening, you may be looking over four, five, and six as the reasons they might actually be happening. So if you don't give an accurate um, list of options um, or you don't allow for the ability to essentially have marginalized pop populations write in their own answers if they're not, if maybe you're missing something, um, then, then the data you collect doesn't actually represent what you're trying to represent because it didn't give enough um, possibilities, right? And that's why pilot studies are so important. So when you start to write up a survey, you're going to want to test it out. You're going to want to know if, hey, is this really going to get me the information that I'm looking for? And is this really going to be, like, if I have an answer that says none of these or something else, or um, my reason is not listed or what have you. And if that's multiple people in your pilot study keep giving you that answer, then you're gonna need to go back and revisit what it is that you're missing, right? And that's something that's important. Um, sampling, so you're really gonna wanna make sure that the, again, you're gonna wanna make sure that your sample is a portion of a larger population. That's just what a sample is, but that it's reflective or representative of that sample. So again, that's just like when I gave the example earlier, if you're going to do your study completely on a college campus, but you want to represent the United States as a whole, that's not going to work because the United States as a whole has many different generations, has many different um, ethnic backgrounds, has many different education levels, has many different income levels, and you're likely not going to find all of that on a college campus. Why? Because you have um, people in the United States that are not college educated and that that would be part of the population that is not um, representative of your sample. And so then you also have things like random sampling. And what you'd end up doing is essentially just getting a portion of, say, a phone book or something um, for a local area or um, get a mailing list via a city and you're essentially just every fifth fifth um, address you're sending something to or what have you, right? So like this is, uh, you're sending a, out your survey. And this sampling method is more trying to, trying to randomly come up with essentially that same representative sample as opposed to um, trying to actively seek one that is statistically the same as that population. An experiment is a research method where your variables are going to be analyzed by controlling one of the variables and then system, uh, systematically changing another. Um, so maybe your variable, um, they're also used in natural sciences like um, and psychology as well, and they're considered the best method for asserting um, has, uh, causality. That depends on what it is you're looking for the causality in. Several social experiments have been done. Um, and there are been some really negative ones, which we'll get into in another um, lecture, but things like the Stanford prison um, experiment, where there were some really, really icky social um, 
experiments done that have really lasting trauma and impact on the subjects. Um, you have comparative and historical sociology, which approaches um, that allows research to understand variations in social phenomena across time and space, right? So comparative research is going to compare one set of findings on a society to the same set of findings in other societies. Um, and that's not just at a society level. Comparative research is done on a group level. Um, on uh, You can even do comparative studies for the same group over time. So like how has how have Catholic Americans um, changed their view on same-sex marriage? And if you did that in the 1920s and then again in the 1960s and then again now, and you looked at really those um, answers via um, church sermons or uh, like however you want to measure it, you're going to see that comparatively things change over time depending on how society impacts different institutions, right? And then you're going to look at you could do oral histories, which are really just interviews with people about events that they witnessed either earlier in their lives or currently witnessing. Um, so we have a lot of different oral history projects that are happening in Kentucky that are really great. Um, and we actually have an oral history, a Kentucky oral history museum. And if you want the information on that, uh, let me know and I will get that to you. Um, and then there's triangul triangulation, which is just a, a research method um, using multiple different research methods um, as a way of producing reliable empirical data um, that isn't available through one specific method. And another way to do that is, um, another thing that people call that is using mixed methods, or I'm going to do a survey here, but then when I get some of my survey information, I'm gonna take another sample, and then I want to do specific, um, specific interviews to kind of maybe get at some of the nuance that came up in the survey like hey this this particular thing came came up can i get some can we expound upon that a little more based on the population that was saying those things um so there are some ethical dilemmas um that have come up in in research um extremely ethical dilemmas um we investigated so Humphreys investigated tea rooms or public restrooms where men would go to have sex with other men, often hiding their secret lives from their wives, children, and coworkers. The problem was that this work was valuable, which it was, but it was ethical and it and it faced it faced the um it outed a lot of people. Um it created a scene, um, it made people highly uncomfortable. Um, and essentially it posed risks to the subjects. So what re researchers really have to think about is does the research pose more risk to the subjects um, than it does, than they face in their everyday lives? And if that answer is yes, then likely what you have to do is restructure what you're trying to do. And then it says, so the scientific gains or benefits of the research balance out the risks to the subject. Um, and that's hotly debated depending on what it is you're doing. So in medical research, maybe having the ability to have something that might work when there's no other option, maybe the risk for... Um, that person is, hey, I, I'm. This is this is my last shot at at trying something. So maybe that the risks of we don't know if this will have side effects outweigh the risks of well, if I don't try this, then I'm not going to survive, right? So there's there's different things that you're looking at, and when it comes to sociological research, there's a lot of mental and physical harm that can be done in sociological research if it's not done in a way that um, has ethical standards. Um, IRBs are just essentially every school has an IRB. Those are the uh, review boards that review research to make sure that your research is not going to do more harm than good, essentially. Um, informed consent is a process where the study um, investigator really informs the person um, or the participants about the risks and benefits and allows them to consent to whether or not they want to be part of the project. Um, and most sociological research has informed consent. The only time maybe you might not have that is in a particular kind of participant observation or something of that nature where maybe you're at a park and you're observing who is using the park or something of that nature. But you have to really be careful to make sure in those ones where you're not giving informed consent that, um, that again, the risks of losing... Um, the freedom to operate in the world without being watched um, is, is worth the benefit of whatever the research is.
I mean, then there's debriefing the the process following a research study whereby an investigator informs participants after the research is over um, that something has been happening. Right. So, hey, um, we were doing this thing. We wanted to debrief you and let you know this is kind of what we saw. Um, how can you use sociological imagination in your life? So sociology can enhance your awareness of cultural differences and societal structures um, and systems of oppression and really allow you the space to look at the world in a way that is not just singularly focused on the social bubble that we grow up in or the social bubble that we learn and experience ourselves. It can improve your ability to assess the success or failure of public initiatives or policies um, and allow you to be a more informed um, voter, a more informed um, political entity, or um, even at a local level or even at a, like, within your workplace that allows you to be able to look at things and say, I don't know if this is working in a way that we want it to, and um, to be more um, aware of how how policies, even at a um, level of even just a singular job, impact others, right? It offers us knowledge and enlightenment that we can use to direct our choices, and it teaches us analytical skills that are important for many future careers. So being able to understand how to go out and get data or answer a question that we have is valuable in so many ways. And that's something that sociology can bring to the table. Um, and so these are again, just uh, review questions for you guys to go ahead and review yourself. Um, I wanna go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you for being part of this course and thank you for listening to this first couple of lectures. They will get more interesting as we really get into more topics um, that cater to a specific notion in sociology as we move through the course. Um, but this is a good idea to just kind of get your, get your feet in the water, get your toes in the water and see how you like the idea of how we're gonna move forward in the course. So um, if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to email me and really just uh, let me know if you have any issues. Thanks.